Hello there, um, before I actually get to the intro of this video, I do want to get a few things out of the way. So first of all, I want to apologise for it being so long since the last War Concept episode. It's like I've said many times though, this is not a series I'm taking as seriously as I am with backtracking, but it's still something I enjoy writing for, and, uh, like, it, it, it is something I enjoy doing, but, you know, I don't expect episodes of this to come out frequently. That's one thing to get off my chest. Another thing is, if I sound a bit slurred, like, more so than usual, it's because I had to get my blood taken uh, this morning, so I might sound a bit weird from time to time. I mean, I know I've got audio issues anyway with my laptop, but I'm bring it a bit closer. I know I've always had really bad audio issues, but uh, like if I sound weirder than normal, that's the reason why I had to get my uh, blood taken this morning uh, for a test. So I'm hoping to find out the results next week, and I, I'm hoping by then I will still have blood in my body. <laughs> and... Um, the last thing is backtracking season three. I'm going to start writing the first episode of that tomorrow. So, considering how many albums there are, it's one, two, three, four. The episode could be out by Sunday. Huh, nice. So yeah, that's a few things I wanted to just get out of the way really quickly, and we're going to go into the actual episode now. So thank you for sticking around for this. Uh, yeah, onwards. So, we're back again with this noise. My first episode went surprisingly well, so I figured that I may as well return the favour with another one, despite the long time gap. Uh, a few facts about this one. Sorry, like, the poor thing was going a bit weird. A few facts about this album, though. This is actually my first Stone Sour album, and as I heard it in 2013, which is when it was released. What drew me in was the song Do Me A Favour, mostly for its really unique music video. When I looked up the album at first, Wikipedia did state it as a concept album, but I didn't really care about that too much at the time. And I didn't listen to the first one because that was released in 2012. And I never really got around to listening to it until I had to do that so that I could write for the first episode of War Concepts. Although, having said that, personally, I'm more biased towards Part 2, not just because it was my first proper Stone Sour album, but also because it feels like it has... I feel like it's got better storytelling at least, better music, better lyrics, and so on and so forth. Going back to the Wikipedia thing briefly, there is a huge section of paragraphs de dedicated to the plot summary, but those ones are different than the interpretations I found for myself, so I'm going to be sticking with the ones that I found because they sound better, and also because the ones I found on Wikipedia seem to be based, based more in the entire comic, which seems to cover both albums, which I don't really understand because Wikipedia only covers part two and not part one. Ugh. Anyway, enough chit-chat confusion about how Wikipedia works. It's time for another episode of World Concept, and this time we open the book on House of Golden Bones Part 2 by Stan Sower. So, we start from the start with the album's first song, Red City. Uh, we pick up right where we left off from Part 1, and Corey Taylor plays the human who wakes up in a mysterious place. It's likely that the fight for dominance against Alan took a lot out of him, especially considering that Alan won that particular fight. Still, the human wakes up and he begins making his way for the Red City, with the mission of preventing the conflagration still fresh in his mind, not to mention the numbers, basically the zombie faction closing in. And from how the story is told, the human almost appears to be a bit more focused, with the lyrics seemingly saying that he never had a chance, but neither did his demons, which gives him sort of a new sense of determination. Uh, musically, the track is really well balanced too, with its length over 4 minutes helping, it's also slow for a majority of that, and a bit later on during the third verse, the switch gets flipped and the clean singing turns into harsh screams and heavy instrumental work. Red City just really sets a good tone for the album's end story, and it's a great way to pick things back up after the end of Who's a Combat Part 1. Next is the song Black John, and it's a good follow-up from Red City, and seems to focus on the human actually reaching that said city, or at least his travels there. At least it depicts his travels there, I mean. But the reason why this album is, uh, why this song is called Black John is because it introduces or at least names a new character, his name being Black John. As we'll find out later, Black John represents the much dark side of the human. Uh, interestingly, the song focuses more on Alan, who helped the human reach the city whilst disguised as a woman. However, Alan is more of a hero for this song, at least, and he starts giving in to temptation that would soon turn him into the bad side of the human, so it's safe to assume that this is Alan actually being a good guy for a little bit. But the human's poor choices lead to Alan becoming more of their conscience and a bunch of repressed memories, and he soon takes over. Alan takes over the human, for clarification. In the song, Alan considers himself a lunatic, saying that heroes and villains come and go, that, and that he wants a chance to prove himself. Uh, in terms of music, it's another well-paced track. It's not as heavy as Red City, but it's still really memorable, even though the story behind the song is a bit more ambiguous and a little bit more confusing, if I'm being honest. 
We then move on to the third song titled Sadist. It's another one from the perspective of Alan, but as we find out that everything goes on about earlier, yeah, it turns out they were trying to pull the wool over the human's eyes. His disguise as the woman is basically taken away, and the song is, from what I saw of Corey Taylor speaking of the album, an internal dialogue between Alan and the human, with Alan doing the talking during the song. It does hark to Alan's own pain, so it could be another reference to what I said in Black John, but it does kind of focus on Alan becoming, becoming more of the villain again. At this point, Alan has given in to temptation and wants the human to join him on the dark side. The line, I'd kill it to take your place, is a good indication of the lengths that Alan's willing to go to to take the human over, or at least keep control if the end of the uh, house of gold mode spot one is anything to go by. Alan claims to be the agony inside the human and wants to inflict that agony on others, hence the song's title. The song itself is super creepy, sets up a good vibe with some great storytelling, and it's one of my favourites on the album. It provides a great insight to Alan's character and his grip of the human, and it's just a really, really good storytelling piece too. Next up is another titular song as we reach the fourth track titled Peckinpah. Whereas Black John represents the darker side of the human, Peckinpah certainly is better side in a way, not outright helping the human all the way through, but being there more as backup if anything. Peckinpah is much older and wiser than the human, and he has a lot of answers, but doesn't want to give them to, uh, away. To quote Corey Taylor himself, he said that Peckinpah is like the Yoda of the story, which makes sense. The song does depict the arrogance that one has when they're younger, so it's a good contradiction with the human representing the younger side, uh, that younger side and thinking that he knew everything once, and Peckinpah being the character who tells the human that he really didn't know everything. The song is a strong showcasing of that theme, and despite being darker in tone, it's a lot more balanced in structure, with the short but no less amazing techno style guitar solo. And it's nice to have new perspectives to draw from too, especially when it's from a character like Peckinpah, who I really like. He's a good voice of reason style character in a world that's literally out to get the human, and it's not the strongest storytelling song, but it does introduce a great character in Peckinpah with ease as he joins the human on his journey to the Red City and to the conflagration. Next up is the album's fifth track, Stalemates, and it's another one of my favourite songs of this album. It's amazingly balanced with the clean moments soaring and the heavy moments crushing as they should be. In terms of the story, I actually couldn't find a lot about it, but from my own interpretation of it, it seems to have more of an internal struggle going on. It's possible that it's told from the human perspective, and he worries about failure and his own freedom is worth, and if his own freedom is worth the fight going on inside himself. Sorry for the slurring, as I mentioned, had my blood taken. This can best be summarised in one of the lyrics from the chorus, The more I fight, I stay the same, which really outlines the human steps about his journey. Speaking of said journey, the human may be getting closer to where he needs to be, and I can't see any help from Peggy Pyre or anyone else. It also does stand a chance that the numbers are growing larger, and the human needs to get moving quicker if he's going to survive the struggle. So yeah, basically, Stalemate is a greatly balanced song with an awesome guitar solo and a nice breakdown at the end, and it builds well on the story, even though I couldn't really find out a whole lot about it, so I'm really sorry about that. We then carry more to carry on to a more atmospheric and memorable track in Gravesend. I was able to find more info about this idea of stalemate, so that's a good stein, uh, sign. Ugh. Anyway, it's another focus on the human as he reaches a graveyard named Gravesend, uh, and he winds up finding a lot of answers about his memories. The problem is, he doesn't really like the answers that he's given, and the mix of those memories fleeing back in the giant thus far really takes a toll on the human. Luckily, the human's mixture of memories and travels does set up the final act of the album's story, and to be honest, I fucking love this song, and it's probably my favourite on the whole album. Josh Randon Newt did such a great job creating this vibe around the situation, with the human lamenting the answers in Hetikin's memories. There's even parts about the human recalling specific years of his life, like letting go of everything when he was 18 and returning home in 25, at, at the age of 25, and going on to claim that he's ready for numb, basically meaning that he truly wants to escape those memories, especially now that the floodgates have opened. It's a great track, and does a fantastic job of setting the last act of the story and the second half of this album. Next up is another great song in 82, with said number referring to the year 1982, an indication of maybe the year of the human's birth. To be honest, and this is a theme with this last half of the album, I really couldn't find a lot of info on this track, so this is very much my own interpretation of it from now on. First of all, it's musically a bit different for a Stone Sour track, having a nice little electric tinge on the guitars, which actually sounds pretty good. Lyrically, it appears to build on the story while falling off from Gravesend well enough, but whilst the human was a lot more lamenting and loathing of his past memories in Gravesend, this song seems to be more of a motivator for him, with the chorus being the biggest indicator of that. 
The human tells us th uh, that Grace Anne is not where he wants to die, or at least it's not where he wants to wind up. He wants to change his fate, and it's possible that 1982 males will be a trigger man before, and much like those he wanted to let go of in the previous song. He also more fully acknowledges the demons, demons inside of himself, but says that they won't have to take his life in a really inspiring way that would have been laughably cheesy in the hands of a less capable storyteller. In some ways, it feels like his peck of is telling the human which direction to go, and, and the music behind the song is punchy enough to deliver the message and the story pretty damn well. I really like the song. We roll right along to the Uncanny Valley, and once again, it's another one I couldn't find a lot on. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, mo most of what's happening there is my own interpretation. Anyway. It's really a shame I couldn't find out a lot about this song, because this is one of the album's bad tracks in terms of storytelling. Musically, it's a a little bit dull back as it's not heavy, as heavy as the rest of the album, but it's still really well balanced and enjoyable with a really good killer guitar solo from Jim Root. Anyway, in terms of lyrics and perspective, it seems to be told from Alan's point of view. It's possible that the Uncanny Valley is a place where he lives, and we do get confirmation that it's in America as he says the line, Rose America on a pennies will rain. I don't know what that means, but it does sort of give us a location of where the story takes place. Anyway, Alan sort of taunts the human with one of the first lines of the song, claiming that the human does seem like he normally does. This could be an indication of the human's newfound desire to change his fate, but the way that Alan speaks in this song is pretty ominous. He simply reminds the human that this is their battle and that everything that the human has is still shattered, as desperate as he is to change that. The song is one of the creepier and more balanced efforts on the album, and the storytelling is top-notch from Alan's point of view, giving us further insight into his mind and how he sees his battle with the human. And we're going to actually cover the next two songs together, much like we did in the first episode. Uh, much like how Gone Sovereign went with Apple Zero and Part 1, so to, so to do these two songs, Blue Smoke, and do me a favour. But let's cover Blue Smoke first. It's more told from the human's perspective, and it sees him fast approaching the end of his journey. The song is only 2 minutes and 7 seconds in length, with it mostly being instrumental, but it sounds really good. It's got... A super creepyish vibe to it, but it's also inspiring in terms of story as the human finally seems to acknowledge his past self, and he's actually proud of the journey that he's made. But then we get to Do Me A Favour, which is definitely told from Alan's perspective. Uh, there is a music video that goes with the song, that do which does help seeing the human reaching a church, but being has its turn to because of Black John being a priest in said church. But the human has no choice but to enter the church anyway as the numbers start to close in. Once inside, he's teamed up on by Alan and Black John, who soon melds into the same demonic person, giving them more power. But then Peckinpah arrives to help the human in the fight, even seemingly sacrificing herself to help the human. There's even moments when, when Peckinpah is hit, the human feels that same pain, so that's a further indication of Peckinpah being the good side of the human. And whenever Alan or Black John were hit, the other would feel that effect, which is a good thing that they meld together because they're basically the same person anyway. Both of these songs are so good together, and the latter of the two is the song that actually got me back into Stone Sour as a band. There's just a great way to both songs, they carry the story well, and they're beautifully balanced in terms of perspectives. With humans seemingly replying to Black John and Alan, uh, slash Alan near the end of Do Me Favor, it just sounds really, really good. Next is another fantastic song in The Conflagration, and I know what you're thinking. You were thinking that this might be the last track, but despite the song being called that, because that's the name of the event that the human was aiming to stop, it's only the second to last song in the album, but to be honest, I would have honestly been happy if this was the final track either way, or if the next song was. But we'll get to that when we get to it. So, once again, the song is a little bit more different and more experimental, and that's a bit of a piano-laced ballad type of tune, but it's still really well balanced, with the backing of said piano work as well as strings helping to build up the song more instrumentally. It's also super strong lyrically as well, with the human going over his haunted past and hoping to finally let it all go if he decides to take his seat for the conflagration itself to happen. He sounds like he actually regrets all of his past life choices, and it's quite an emotional kick to the gut sometimes. The real kicker, no pun intended, uh, is as the song closes, with the human realising that he's all alone, which may indicate that Peckinpah was killed, with it likely having happened to also Black John and Alan, because although those two are the antagonists of the story, they were still a very important part of the human's life at one point. It then closes with the creepy chant of Are You 486 by the numbers again, and it leads us expertly into the last song on the album. And lastly, here we are, the final track, the titular, The House of Golden Bones. And holy crap, what a great way to cap things off. 
in contrast to the piano ballad of the Conf conflagration this one is a bit more aggressive and heavy once again featuring another killer guitar solo but a much more fast-paced one in terms of story it's a great way to wrap things all up hell there's even a lyric video for the song itself that actually shows panels of the comic that the albums are based on so that's actually pretty helpful for those who need a more visual guide and also set comic actually explains the main story way better than i ever could but in my defense i never said that i was good at this Anyway, the House of Golden Bones sees the human looking back on his journey and thinking about his choices of the conflagration, which weren't the best ones, and lead to the House of Golden Bones being burned to the ground because of what he did. But thanks to this, the human realizes the mistakes that he made and decides to re try and rebuild it a bit better and a bit stronger, claiming to himself that, with a genuine heart and a clear conscience, he can rebuild his life from the ground up, hoping to have a good go of it before the opportunity escapes him. He then wakes up in the real world. So, maybe this is all a dream. Probably. What a weird dream. A really good one, though, because it gave us a great story. And so, that was it. That was a Golden Bones Part 2. I'm sorry that it took so long, but I honestly had a lot of fun running it when I was taking it a bit more seriously. As I mentioned at the start, I do like Part 2 better than I like Part 1, but both albums are still really great at carrying a really awesome conceptual story. I think I tried analysing the themes of Part 1, but that was a while ago, so I'll focus on what I can remember from this album a bit more. As Corey Taylor himself has said, it is about the struggle within humans and what type of life, life they choose to live. But thanks to the closing moments of House of Golden Bones Part 2, it also seems to be about having a second chance at rebuilding that life if you fucked up the first time. The human is a believable enough hero, not being a typical hero, and being fully aware of, of what kind of person he is, but his willingness to change what he can be endeared me to him honestly. Alan was probably my favourite character and I loved hearing Corey play the bad guy. I could almost feel the evil smile on his face as he played those parts. <coughs> Black John was also a great villain and seemed to convey this mysterious air about him to really great effect. Uh, Peck and Paul might be kind of late to the party in terms of story, but he's still a really vital character and really represents the good side of the human, essentially being an older version of him and knowing the dangers of the kind of life that the human was living, and I also just really like Peck and Paul. The numbers were also a scary enough faction, even though I never felt like we got enough from them. I do like the RU4A6 chant though, it's super creepy and kind of catchy at the same time, and they do feel like a genuine threat most of the time, so it helps. I really liked the story and themes, the music was balanced well enough with the storytelling, and there was some great lyrical work, and there's a lot more depth to the songwriting than people think, and I mean that beyond a simple story standpoint. Regardless, I really, really enjoyed everything that I heard from both parts of House and Golden Bones. Both albums are really, really good, so not much else needs to be said. Great story, good music, great characters to be honest. I liked it. Well done, Corey Taylor, you're a mad genius, and I love you. <laughs> and with that, I guess it's finally time to wrap this all up. I have a few ideas for what concept I want to cover next in this series, but that'll be a little bit more down the line as I have backtracking season 3 to get through first. Anyway, thank you for listening. You're awesome. Bye-bye.